Welcome to The Era of Jim Crow and the Nadir of Race Relations, Part 2, an online U.S. history tutorial for students in 11th grade. Many people found Jim Crow laws unacceptable, most obviously African Americans, but some Southern whites as well. In 1890, Louisiana passed a state law segregating railway cars by race. The Citizens Committee of New Orleans, a group of black and white activists, decided to challenge the law. They needed a test case, someone willing to deliberately break the law and be arrested in order to put the law itself on trial. The committee persuaded Homer Plessy to be that test case. Plessy was a Creole, a descendant of Louisiana's original French settlers. He had light skin and, to most people, appeared to be white. But one of Plessy's great-grandparents had had black skin. So Plessy was what was known at the time as an Octoroon, someone who was one-eighth black. This made Homer Plessy a particularly good test case. If he had simply sat in a whites-only rail car and acted discreetly, he would probably not have been arrested, as his mixed race wasn't very obvious. But the fact that Plessy, who looked white, could legally be arrested for sitting in the rail car was perfect evidence of the absurdity of the law, thought the Citizens Committee. After Plessy boarded the whites-only car and took a seat, he was promptly arrested by a private detective the Citizens Committee had hired to do so. The incident was entirely staged to create the grounds for a court battle over the segregation law. In court, Homer Plessy was found guilty of violating the law by Judge John Howard Ferguson. He was fined $25. Plessy and his lawyers appealed the decision to the Louisiana State Supreme Court. That court upheld or agreed with the lower court's ruling. Plessy and his legal team then appealed the case all the way to the United States Supreme Court, the highest in the country. The justices agreed to hear the case in 1896, four years after Plessy's arrest. Before the justices of the Supreme Court, Homer Plessy's lawyers argued that Louisiana's law segregating railroad cars was unconstitutional because it violated the 14th Amendment. That amendment guarantees the same rights to all citizens of the United States, black or white, and says that no state shall deny its citizens the equal protection of the laws. As far as Plessy was concerned, forcing black citizens to use segregated facilities obviously meant that they were being treated as inferior, not fit to ride in the same cars as white passengers. Plessy's legal team hoped that if the Supreme Court struck down Louisiana's law in principle, that the ruling would also undermine the legal basis of other segregation laws, perhaps ending the era of Jim Crow. Instead, in the case of Plessy v. Ferguson, the justices ruled against Homer Plessy by a vote of 7 to 1. The majority rejected the idea that Louisiana's law violated the 14th Amendment. It also rejected the idea that a law segregating African Americans necessarily implied that they were inferior. As long as the facilities, in this case the rail cars, were separate but equal, the court said segregation laws were perfectly legal as public policy. Instead of invalidating the principle behind Jim Crow segregation, the Supreme Court had strengthened it. From this point on, there would be little or no way to challenge Jim Crow laws legally now that the Supreme Court had given them the blessing of the federal government. Only one justice dissented or disagreed with the majority. Justice John Marshall Harlan agreed with Homer Plessy that segregation laws created second-class citizenship in defiance of the Constitution. Harlan wrote, Our Constitution is colorblind and neither knows nor tolerates classes among citizens. In respect of civil rights, all citizens are equal before the law. The law regards man as man and takes no account of his surroundings or of his color when his civil rights as guaranteed by the supreme law of the land are involved. It is therefore to be regretted that this Supreme Court has reached the conclusion that it is competent for a state to regulate the enjoyment by citizens of their civil rights solely upon the basis of race. Justice Harlan predicted that one day, the other justices' decision in Plessy v. Ferguson would be seen as infamous and regrettable, like the court's 1857 decision Dred Scott v. Sanford had come to be viewed in his own era. Jim Crow segregation insisted that African Americans play a socially inferior role in society. Why did this abuse last as long as it did? The era of Jim Crow and the nadir of race relations lasted as long as they did, not only because of the segregation laws on the books, but because of something else in the culture, unofficial and unacknowledged, yet very real. This was the violence and the fear of violence that formed the backdrop of daily life for African Americans in the South. Black parents in the South had to teach their children not to be rude, defiant, or uppity to their white neighbors even in the face of racism or abuse. 
the consequences of acting otherwise could be deadly. The Nadir period saw an epidemic of lynchings in the United States. Most lynchings took place in the South, and most, but not all, of their victims were black. From 1877 to 1950, according to a recent study by the Equal Justice Initiative, nearly 4,000 black men, women, and children were the victims of Southern lynchings. The worst period of all was the 1890s, the decade when Plessy v. Ferguson was decided. Well, over a thousand black citizens were lynched during that period of time. The practice, however, was active well into the 20th century. Twenty lynchings were reported in 1935, for example. What exactly is a lynching? A lynching is a murder done extrajudicially, outside the justice system. Lynchings are public executions, usually carried out by a mob or other informal group. Their immediate purpose is to punish an individual for a crime, real or imagined, but a very important secondary purpose of a lynching is to intimidate others. In the case of the Jim Crow South, lynchings were meant to send a message of domination to all African Americans, that this is what happens to those who don't know their place, or to those who challenge white supremacy. Needless to say, widespread lynchings created a fearful environment, an atmosphere of terror, that helped maintain racial segregation for generations. In some cases, the victims of lynchings were suspected of real crimes, robbery, assault, or rape. Because a lynching took the place of a trial by jury, there's no certain way of knowing which crimes were real and which were exaggerated or completely made up. But in many other cases, victims of lynchings were guilty only of defying the social conventions of Jim Crow. In 1940, for example, Jesse Thornton of Laverne, Alabama called a white police officer by his first name instead of Mr. The officer organized a mob, and Thornton was lynched. There are many misconceptions about lynchings. Not all victims were hanged from a rope tied to a tree. Lynching victims could be beaten to death, shot, or burned alive. Some were tortured first. Most lynchings were not carried out by the Ku Klux Klan. In fact, there was no organized Klan in the United States between the end of Reconstruction and 1915, the worst era for this crime. Lynchings were not always carried out in secret or at night. Some became mass spectacles with a circus-like atmosphere. They were announced beforehand in the local newspaper. Families with children sometimes attended. Lynchings were widely photographed. Many, many photos exist of onlookers, even the murderers themselves, posing with the lifeless bodies. We've not included these graphic images in this tutorial. No one should be forced to see them, but they are very easy to find. The lynching epidemic became a national disgrace. Lynching was murder, and murder everywhere in the United States was a crime. In response to criticism, southern states passed their own anti-lynching laws. But in reality, they meant next to nothing because they were not enforced. Those who would prosecute the crime and those who would sit on a jury were typically the friends, neighbors, and relatives of those who had committed the murder. As a result, those who murdered African Americans were rarely charged with their crimes, and even if they were, they were almost never found guilty by all-white juries. Black jurors were not allowed to serve in Jim Crow states. The Equal Justice Initiative reports that of all lynchings committed after 1900, only 1% resulted in a participant being convicted of a criminal offense. Many in the North and in Congress wanted the government to pass a federal anti-lynching law to allow the U.S. Justice Department to investigate and prosecute these crimes. Against this, the politicians of the South protested mightily. Some claimed that such a federal law would be a violation of states' rights. Others actually went as far as to actually defend lynching as a Southern tradition. Ben Tillman, a senator and former governor of South Carolina, proudly defended the practice in 1900. We of the South have never recognized the right of the Negro to govern white men, and we never will. We have never believed him to be the equal of the white man, and we will not submit to his gratifying his lust on our wives and daughters without lynching him. Progressive activists like Ida B. Wells wrote and spoke out against the lynching epidemic. A journalist, Wells was the nation's leading anti-lynching crusader for 40 years, but she and other activists met with limited success. When federal anti-lynching bills came before Congress in the early 1900s, they were consistently voted down by a block of Southern Democrats, the Solid South, they called themselves. In 1903, President Theodore Roosevelt made public statements condemning lynching, and Southern congressmen retaliated by blocking a bill important to the president. Roosevelt learned his political lesson. If you want Southern votes, don't mention lynching. When he next campaigned in the South, he refused to comment further on the subject. By the 1920s, lynching had become a major national issue. 
the NAACP, the nation's leading civil rights organization, displayed a flag outside its national headquarters that read, A man was lynched yesterday. The banner would hang for the next 18 years. Congressman Leonidas Dyer of Missouri introduced to Congress the strongest anti-lynching bill yet. It would have made lynching a federal felony. Dyer's bill was introduced and voted on numerous times, and in 1922 it actually passed the House of Representatives. But in the U.S. Senate, Southerners filibustered or blocked the bill from becoming a law. In 1934, another federal anti-lynching bill, the Costigan-Wagner Bill, was introduced by two senators. Senate leaders tried to convince President Franklin D. Roosevelt to lend his support to the bill, but Roosevelt would not. He worried that taking a strong stand against lynching would cost him the votes of white Southerners and doom his reelection. From 1882 to 1968, nearly 200 anti-lynching bills were introduced in Congress. None became law. In 2005, the U.S. Senate passed a resolution formally apologizing for its past failure to take action when action was most needed. Considering the social, economic, and political circumstances black citizens faced during the nadir of race relations, you may assume that there was a mass movement of African Americans out of the region during this time. Yet for a number of reasons, this movement was slow to develop. Some did leave. For example, in 1879, about 6,000 Southern blacks moved to Kansas, and as many as 20,000 may have followed the next year. These exodusters, as they came to be called, moved to the West to settle cheap land and escape racism, and some were successful. Nicodemus, Kansas, which still exists today, is probably the best-known Western community founded by black settlers. But in the South, there was a backlash, as some white leaders worried that the loss of black laborers would hurt their region economically. For a time, the Mississippi River was actually closed to black migration by armed whites who patrolled the river and threatened to sink the boats of exodusters trying to cross. Not surprisingly, migration to the West dwindled. Migration to the cities of the North and Midwest offered another opportunity, and some African Americans took advantage of it. Most found better opportunities, but wherever they went, they found that racism existed in the North as well as the South, even if Jim Crow laws did not. As late as the 1900s, 90% of black Americans still lived in the South, as you can see on this chart. The percentage is basically unchanged from decades earlier, even from the time before the Civil War when most had been slaves. A significant drop in this number would not occur until after 1910. This is not a coincidence. In 1914, World War I began in Europe, and in 1917, the United States joined the war. The wartime economy created new opportunities for African Americans, who were actively recruited by northern businesses. For the first time, black families moved from the south to the north in numbers large enough to affect the demographics of the nation. The phenomenon is known as the Great Migration. It did not end with World War I, but lasted for the next 50 years, until by 1970, only 53% of black Americans remained in the south. The trend has slightly reversed itself only in recent decades. When and why did the nadir of race relations end? The turning point came in the 1940s after World War II. Almost all historians agree that, while Jim Crow laws still remained on the books, this was the end of the nadir period. For one thing, the color line that segregated black and white culture began to blur. In 1947, Jackie Robinson became the first African American to play Major League Baseball when he was signed by the Brooklyn Dodgers. In music, rock and roll singers like Chuck Berry became wildly popular with white teenagers. Politics soon caught up. In 1948, President Harry Truman desegregated the U.S. armed forces by executive order. Beginning with the Korean War, black and white soldiers would fight alongside one another for the first time in the modern era. In 1954, the civil rights movement truly began with the Supreme Court's decision in Brown v. Board of Education. In the Brown decision, the justices unanimously declared that school segregation anywhere was unconstitutional. States with Jim Crow education laws were ordered to desegregate their schools with all deliberate speed. The decision essentially overturned the principle of the court's 1896 decision in Plessy v. Ferguson, which had defended the principle of separate but equal. Other forms of segregation, however, would linger for the next decade. In 1955, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. rose to national prominence as a leader of the Montgomery bus boycott. Dr. King's strategy of using nonviolent protest to defeat segregation laws would define the early years of the civil rights movement. And in 1964, President Lyndon B. Johnson signed into law the Civil Rights Act of 1964. 
the landmark law outlawed discrimination and segregation based on race, color, religion, sex, or national origin. The next year, Johnson signed the Voting Rights Act of 1965, which prohibited racial discrimination in voting. These two acts comprised the effective end of the shameful era of Jim Crow.